welcome Caroline Larrasee yeah. to a training round them. We go back a long time, but before we dive deep into kind of a bit of history about where we met and everything, tell me about what your role is. What are you doing presently at the moment? So I'm the Chief Executive of the National Hair and Beauty Federation. So the National Hair and Beauty Federation is the trade organisation for the hair, beauty and aesthetic sector. And we provide business support. So we're like a safety net mm -hmm. for businesses. So we can provide all the materials that you need to do run a safe, legal and healthy business. Right. So I know you gave a lot of support over the kind of the last four or five years, but as you're moving forward, I think what's really great at this present moment, everyone kind of is finding there's been an economical decline. And I think what's happening now is people are searching really for where to go and what to do. So we're going to begin really a little bit kind of talk to me and tell me about Caroline at 16. So Caroline at 16 was a YTS student, uh -huh. um, so, um, well actually, no, tell a lie, I wasn't. I first started as a full-time college student, mm -hmm. um, did a hair and beauty program, and I went on to work placement, mm -hmm. and I started my work placement a couple of days in, and the owner said, I need you in my salon, um, um, can, will you come on a YTS program? So I went back to the college and said, still want to do hair and beauty, but I've got this opportunity to work in the salon. Uh, and the, the YTS at the time fit perfectly. So right. that was great and I was able to retain my beauty. So you, you did beauty? Yeah, as well as hairdressing. So, so then you did. Right. So now you don't, you tend to specialise in either hairdressing or beauty or if you have a combined hair mm -hmm. and beauty, it's usually an introduction to mm -hmm. the sector and then you specialise because as you know, the industries are completely different. Um, they are, but I think really looking back, there's a model really that actually there's kind of midway. So I think, you know, we're championing kind of best practice, all about training, regulated qualifications, and I think there's been a very grey area. So when you were trained originally, what do you feel was better back then that maybe isn't quite available now? I think for me, um, what was really good for me then was that the science was taught separately. Mm. So you had a separate science mm -hmm. lesson with a science tutor because when, you know, when you, you know, you're um, learning your hairdressing and your beauty, you know, there is a lot of science mm -hmm. in there. You know, there's a lot of bio biology, there's chemistry mm -hmm. in there. There's all the various different Things. And at that period of time, it was taught mm -hmm. separately, same as your maths and your English. Mm -hmm. um, it was more contextualised, mm -hmm. whereas now I think it's a, a lot separately. So mm -hmm. there were some good things, but there were also some bad things as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think those pros and cons, and I think now it, the delivery has changed, um, particularly college training mm -hmm. has changed. And um, I know that the delivery on the on the job, which is like the apprenticeship, is a lot better. Because the training providers are more up to date than mm -hmm. what the colleges are, but the colleges haven't had the funding. No, no, yeah. so it's a difficult moment, isn't there? So the timeline from 16 to kind of when you did your clients and when you felt confident, what was that kind of how long did that take, would you say? Oh, well, that was very quick for me. Uh -huh. um, just this basically, I was in um, this salon and I was doing hairdressing, but it also introduced beauty mm -hmm. because as I started learning the beauty side of things, I started having, you know, training nets, but we also started introducing the beauty to the clients as well, which is something completely mm -hmm. different to the salon. Then I was, in, um, I'd say, mm, just over 12 months into my YTS program, and the salon owner just said to me, oh, my senior stylist is leaving. I need a replacement, so you either step up to the mark, mm -hmm. or I'm afraid there's not going to be a job at the mm -hmm. end of your YTS program. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up having a, an intense two-day training mm -hmm. over the weekend, mm -hmm. and hey, presto, Monday morning, I was upon clients. So I'm one of those people that I'm a visual people, so if mm -hmm. I can see somebody do something, do it. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate mm -hmm. like that. I know not everybody else is a learner like mm -hmm. that, but I was like that. So, And I love being thrown into the deep end. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's where I flourish. And I think that's going to come up quite a lot in this conversation because obviously 2012, part of the Bruce Keogh report, that's kind of where I first kind of came to know you. So you did hair, you did beauty, you kind of worked in a salon, you did your footprint. And then obviously you kind of went behind the scenes to support people. I think 
you, did you go to happier or what, what was so, your transition? So after that, um, and basically it was a lifestyle change. Right. Um, basically because I was told I got a bad back um, from being in hairdressing and right. bending over all the time and maybe I need to look at another uh, repair option. And this was me at being 19 year old. So it's like, oh, 19 year old. I thought I got loads of years in me in the mm-hmm. salon and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, I thought, right, well, I'll go into teaching. And, and particularly because I've been involved with the local college and the learners that were coming through to the business just weren't the high enough standard that we needed in the salon. So we'd actually started doing extra training nights, and I've been doing that for the salon. So mm-hmm. went to the college, and the college said, right, well, you need to do the 7307 teaching qualification. Mm-hmm. So it's like, great, yeah, I'll do that. Um, and they said, oh, you need to pop over to the hairdressing department, and they'll give you a couple of hours as like work experience of being able to do that. So popped up as a hairdressing department. Yep, yeah, no problem. Uh, next Wednesday evening, do you want to take a class? Great. So I rocked so this up. This was 19. This was 19, yeah. Wow. So 19, I rocked up to this class and they literally said, there's this stock department, there's your class. Get on with it. And it was a great, it was me. I was like, that's it, love it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I got this uh, um, class of mature students, it was, and it was uh, really good. And I ended up actually near enough within a year working full time for the college. Um, because every time somebody said, oh, I can't do this class, it's like, yeah, 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 I'll do that, I'll do that. Because I loved um, the college environment. And I think that's where it sort of took me on. Um, I worked for quite a few colleges. And then um, I decided that really um, I wanted to go into more of the management side of it. I was very interested in the education and training and raising the standards. And I think that comes back from having those learners in the sample mm. that weren't up to scratch. And so, therefore, I ended up taking over um, an academy um, in Sheffield. We did Derbyshire and South Yorkshire. I ran that academy for, oh, my goodness, about five years, five years, I think it was. Was this a private academy? So this was a private training Mm. school hairdressing. This was nothing to do with beauty. No. This was just hairdressing, um, and I loved that, and I grew the team from a really small salon uh, um, and academy within Sheffield to, as I say, across Derbyshire and South Yorkshire, which was absolutely fantastic. We had loads of learners coming through um, uh, as part of that. And then um, we had we had an inspection. I was nominee inspection. Oh, my goodness, that was the first time that inspections had been introduced mm-hmm. into training providers. Didn't go as great as what we wanted to, so we moved it uh, um, around. And then I got the opportunity. Uh, um, uh, the owner of the business had decided he wanted to diversify and do stuff. Um, and I got the opportunity to take a year out. So I took a year out, did the travelling around the world, did all right. that side of things because I was 30 at yeah. the time. And um, anybody who's been on a working visa to Australia mm-hmm. knows after 30 you can't do it. Yeah. So it was like a now or never yeah. opportunity. Um, so I did that. I worked in loads and loads of hair salons in Australia mm-hmm. and beauty salons. I, I could tell you loads and loads of stories. Mm-hmm. One of the salons. Podcast two comment. <laughs> <laughs> One of the salons was on the boat harbour with wow. beauty and hair, and people used to come from the yachts and come to the salons, nice. uh, which was fabulous. And yeah, there were some lovely, lovely ladies. That was an absolutely fantastic experience. And yeah, I've done. But all of it. The thing is, I wouldn't think the pair and beauty, no matter where you are, you can always find yourself a job. I think this is the key thing, you know. I, I think people don't understand when you've got a skill and you've got a joy and you've got a love, I think you can diversify out. And I think hearing the passion come from you just takes that moment, really, that I think people don't understand, really, when you love what you do, you yeah. really can excel. So at 30, you yeah. did a year out, you went yeah. to Australia. Why didn't you say stay in Australia, then what brought you back? So um, what brought me back? Well, I was on a year's visa in Australia, right. and so you get kicked out after yeah. a year anyway. Right. But my sister actually ended up stopping in Australia uh-huh. and living in Australia, um, so she sort of did it after me right. uh, uh, and uh, married an Australian. Um, yeah, she, she, she's back now. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> but anyway, so I did that. So I came back and um, I thought, hmm, I'm not real sure what I want to do. Um, so I phoned the lady who I used to have the business with and said, could I come and do a few hours in the mm-hmm. salon? Because I just need a bit more, a bit of money because I've obviously been away mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. Literally within two days, I got all my clients back in the salon. Yeah. It was like crazy. It was like the, the, the message went around the village and everybody mm-hmm. 
Um, but also I wanted to go back into education and training. Um, so a friend of mine said, oh, there's a, um, was it a partnership, some in-partnership training that was it in Chesterfield. They want a skills for life tutor. Now, I know you've done your key skills um, awards and stuff before you went away. So I'd already done some training. Um, they wanted a key skills tutor to do um, adult literacy and numeracy. So I was like, oh, that's great. That's a bit of a part-time job as well as on the salon. That would mm-hmm. tie things over until I decide what I wanted to do. So got that job, went for the interview, got the job started. Within a week, um, the company had been bought over by this big um, organization called NLT Training. And it was like, oh, great, I've just landed myself a job, yeah. and now it's like it's all in, in, up in the air. So um, the chief executive at the time, um, a guy called Frank, uh, was interviewing all the staff and stuff like that, and he just went to me when we were having a chat, and he went, I, why are you working for Skills for Life Tutor? When I can see your CV, you've got loads of you know, regional academies and stuff like that. And I told him the tale mm-hmm. and everything like that. And he came back to me a couple of days later and said, I want you to manage our full sites in Derbyshire. Um, so there was three sites in Derbyshire and one in Chesterfield as well. And I want to take over, you to take over the uh, provision for basic skills, adult literacy, numeracy, job centre floors, so or all the various different Order. things like that. And it was like, ooh, um, all right, yeah, we'll have a go, you know, for an profound. So I did that, and this was an engineering company. Um, so, you know, Caroline from Hair and Beauty with, you know, the hair, the nails, the makeup, I had to sort of pare it back a little bit because then I was sort of mingling with a lot of um, engineering, construction, um, sort of um, motor so How did you take the skill set from hair, beauty, across? How did you manage to do that? Was so, it no, well, training's training mm-hmm. and management is management. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's what it was. And it was about bringing, you know, the human factor in there and just, you know, learning as you go along. I mean, I did that for, I did that for about five years. I loved my time mm-hmm. at NLT, you know. It was out of my comfort zone because, as I say, it was engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're still going now. It's still yeah. interested in doing that. And then um, I worked alongside the Chamber of Commerce in Chesterfield, Mm -hmm. and their chief exec came to me and went, our training's not going very well, Caroline, Mm -hmm. and I would love you to come Mm -hmm. and work for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, And uh, um, I thought, well, why not? So yeah, uh, I went in there. Um, It was a Chamber of Commerce and Business Link at the time, which was absolutely great. Um, went in there to do their training and stuff like that. She specifically put me in this role to do that. Unfortunately, she sort of left six months later as I was just pulling everything mm-hmm. into gear. Um, new CEO wasn't that way focused. Mm-hmm. So the job sorted eking down. And um, I again, I think I spoke to a friend and said, I'm not sure if it's not. I can't do what I want to mm-hmm. do. I'm very much, I want to get in there and mm-hmm. change things and make things better. But when you sort a little bit story with anything, you get frustrated. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, a friend of mine said, oh, um, there's a job at Havia. Mm-hmm. And I went, mm, who's Havia? Mm-hmm. She went there, the hair and beauty industry authority. She thought you'd have heard. I went, no, I've not heard mm-hmm. of them at all. She's well, the Sector Skills Council for the sector. Mm-hmm. And there's a massive government reform called the 14 to 19 diplomas. Mm-hmm. And they're radically going to change 14 to 19 education for hair and beauty. Hair yeah. and beauty is my passion. Yeah. I've got the opportunity to change, you know, the sector yeah. and improve the sector. So it was like, what was How it? How old were you at this thing? I was, let me think, I must have been... Ah, oh, 35 maybe. Yeah, maybe 35, 35, maybe a bit younger actually thinking about it. Must have been because it was 2006. Ooh, gosh, that's making me feel really <laughs> <laughs> um, But yeah, um, so um, and I actually went on the job and then I did it on a whim. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because I thought, mm, again, you know, let's, mm-hmm. let's have a go. Um, went for the interview and um, with Alan Goldsworth, which was mm-hmm. the previous chief exec there. And I um, I loved the interview. I loved the people that I got introduced mm-hmm. to. 
Um, and um, I got shown around there and then, and that's a bit of a telling thing when you have an interview with people actually go, oh, I just want to introduce you to the team and stuff like that. And to be honest, I was 50-50 mm -hmm. whether I was actually going to go for the interview or not. Um, but yeah, um, and as I say, the, the 14 to 19 diplomas was a whole new thing. It got me going, traveling across the UK, raising um, the standards within hair and beauty and doing all that side of things, which was absolutely great. And then as governments do, it all got changed by years later. Um, but at that moment in time, um, Javi had become part of the Skills Active Group. Mm -hmm. um, so when the Skills Active Group took over Javier, um, what they wanted was somebody to head up um, sports, um, play work, um, elite athlete, yoga, mm -hmm. all the various mm -hmm. different things, as well as hair and beauty, because hair and beauty was just a tiny little part of that. So, again, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, you reinvented yourself. I reinvented myself uh, um, and ended up taking over head of standards and qualifications across the Skills Active Group, wow. which included Javier, which was really strange at the time because. Um, Jane Goldsborough, who was the director of quality and standards at Javier, who I used to work for, actually was working for me now, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. really, really quite, it was quite a strange dramatic, but we, you know, it was, it was just what we needed mm -hmm. to do at the time. So, yeah, so we, um, yeah, did, did that, did that for a number of years as well. The government changed again, priorities changed, budget for skills active went, they took all the budgets off the sector mm -hmm. skills councils. And the Sector Skills Council went from about 200 employees to 10. And I was one of those 10 that was uh, um, carried around. The job was still needed doing. It was just the funding just went. Bits of the organisation segmented off all over the place. It took about um, a year to do um, as part of that. And yeah, you have to ride with the tide, whatever, whatever government I think in. what I'm kind of feeling is that it's almost like a magnet you just felt like you were attracted, you, you changed and you kind of up-leveled yourself, took on the challenge, dived in and made the best of it. Yeah, I'm never frightened of a challenge no. and I think that comes from my hair and beauty background. Does it? Because for the simple fact is when you're working with a client, whether you're working as a therapist or mm. a hairdresser, you never know who's going to come through the door mm. and what they ask. Mm. And I think one of the things that is not really um, recognised within the sector is all the well-being stuff that we do mm. for clients. You know, I mean, sometimes we can we have to deal with their deepest, darkest mm. secrets that they share with mm. the hairdresser and beauty therapist. Mm. And sometimes clients come in and download stuff on mm. it, or you have to sort situations out, or they might have a lump or a bump and you mm. need to push them in there. I think the skill set for a hairdresser and a beauty therapist is so wide and people just don't realise no. that. I always say we're sometimes the fourth emergency service yeah, because absolutely. people actually tell their therapist things that they wouldn't, I mean, I know about husbands and yeah. missuses yeah. and all sorts of we things. We could write many books. We could, you know, I keep saying I'm going to write a book. On I think we should, I'll definitely read it. <laughs> I'll definitely read um, but it. But I just think it's, it's one of the things that I, currently I'm going to government about mm. because um, it's all about this social prescribing. Mm. And, you know, there's such a budget out there that, you know, the NHS can't do all no. the services that they need to do. They just haven't got the people no. and they've not got the funding to do it. But there's so many therapies that social prescribing, you can actually, you know, pour somebody into one of those therapies and it will, better than popping pills, yeah. is a lot better than, you know, having... And I think people since COVID are recognising, really taking their own wellness and there's a real marching kind of fast lane of people that are educating themselves through podcasts, through social yeah. media, taking that onus. And what I really, since meeting you back in 2012, watching you from the sidelines... You really do champion the sector. You really do go to government. You've got in through doors. You've really kept that door open. And bringing it to the aesthetics world, without you, Caroline, 100% as a non-medic sat here and as a training provider, you have been the backbone as a stakeholder and pushed yourself forward as a voice for us. And I think people out there do not recognize 
you for what you have achieved, what you have done for this sector, and how hard you've championed to keep that door open. And I've seen that myself. And I think now the position that you're holding and at the forefront and the amount of energy that you put into this sector, really the accolade that you deserve now in the position that you have as a forefront, where do you see this position? What do you want to happen within the industry? So for me, uh, the biggest thing and the biggest criticism we get is we're a pink and fluffy and, you know, not credible industry. And that drives me absolutely insane. So um, I'm not in as much as what you are. I've been in this now, what, from the aesthetic side of things, on, on fighting our corner, it must be 15 years. It must be 15 years since, we, you know, we did all of this. You've been in 100% of that 15 years. It's not when it was trying or it's not when you were getting yeah. something from it you were the backbone you were the name that actually stopped people from treading on us and I remember being and meeting you as in Javier as part of NOS at the time going back and a group of people spending so much time with that why should we be deciding this name that name and what this should be and I kind of sat back and I thought oh my God, you know, it's so difficult. And you just trailblazed through this and you got it to where it needed to be and you pin pin marked it on where it needed to be because of your skill set, because of all the experience you've got. And what I like about you is you really kind of see individuals for who they are, what they are, and you champion from all backgrounds. So with NHBF bringing it forward to where you're sitting now. So National Hair and Beauty, it was National Hair and Beauty. You kind of changed that terrain. I remember when you yeah. joined it. So, um, so literally, um, I was at Javier for about 13 years, which was mm. quite a long period of time. Oscar Javier scores active for about 13 years. And then I'd um, worked alongside the chief executive at the time, Hilary Hall, mm -hmm. um, the National Hairdressers Federation, as it was. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd actually worked on apprenticeships. And it was like, well, oh, Javier should be heading up on the apprenticeships. And she was like, well, the NHBF should. And I went, well, you're just hairdressers. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah. We're, you know, across the board, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And the government just went, guys, you need to work together. Yeah. Uh, um, so both of the organisations were sort of made to work together and it was a bit like, Mm -hmm. But you know, it's for the good of the sector, I and mean, you've got to forget that you and know. Can we just kind of take a moment there because what I find is everybody kind of wants a piece, but oh, nobody wants yeah. to work together. And I think this is where you really are at the forefront. Everything that you've been involved in, you've got it past the finish line because. You truly 100% see the vision and there's no ego, there's no one person. You bring people together who are experts and you've got this real knack of being able to weave the best out of everybody. And I think that's because genuinely your soul really has got the best for the championing of the learner the champion of the person yeah. and what their skill is going to be at the end of this so you now with an hbf and where your position is what what where do you see that going i think the the thing is from that is i'm from the sector mm. so i'm not paid to do my job i do my job because i love the sector which i 100 um, percent can feel that next and, to you and, now. and that's and that's the thing you know it's given me an absolutely fantastic career mm -hmm. it's allowed me to like i just said we're going to australia it's allowed me to do so many various different things in my life and yes i've been fortunate to be in the person in the right position at the right time to do that but i've also pushed on various different things um, as part of that i truly believe you know across the board there needs to be academic progression you know within the sector i can't stand this medic versus non-medic thing it's just absolutely crazy i'll tell you i have been head to head with people like that in the medical field telling me how poor beauty therapists are how badly the training is and i'm sorry the training is absolutely fantastic for beauty therapy. The levels are really good. And I don't know how many times I've spoken to training providers and said, 
I've had somebody from medical background and I've had somebody from beauty background and their knowledge of their AMP and all their various different fundamentals are a lot superior than the general uh, qualifications part of that. And then what's one of the biggest things that sort of I, I've been campaigning? So I've been involved, as you know, with the JCCP right from the start before the JCCP. So it was, you know, it was the big with you, you know, and we, we did all that. And, you know, TIFF was involved in all of that and feeding back. And then from that, there was a recommendation to create this organisation. 2018, was, I think, wasn't was it? it? It's a crazy six yeah. years ago. Yeah. Kind of really all should have been signed off back then. And yeah. here we are sat in 2024. Yeah. And it's just absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. So we did that. And um, as part of that, I uh, um, pulled all the organisations within the beauty sector together and said, look, we need to make, uh, make sure we're around the table to develop this new organisation because it's in our favour, uh, medics' favour, and we need to make sure it's all you know across the board. So we had the um, aesthetic practitioner, something called the group it was, that was led by Javier, and I, I chaired that. And we brought all the standards because in hairdressing and beauty and all the um, advanced beauty practices it used to be called, you always had national occupational standards. So we always had the standards there. So we were like, here's the standards, this is the practice, this is all the various different things. And we supported the development of the JCCP and the one register, the one register we were supposed to have, you know, blah, blah, blah. And as you know, that register then got split which was one of the worst things they actually did because the whole idea of all of this was there was going to be one register. Isn't it joint means one? Yeah, which was so, so frustrating. Um, I mean, I was asked to be a part of the JCCP because I'd been instrumental in the creation of it. At the time, I was the only therapist on there. So, um, and I think the JCCP at the moment, I think you've got Joan that's still on there. I think there's only two people, it's 15 people on that board, mm. only two from the beauty sector. Mm. So you can imagine going into meetings and like, you know, raise, and they didn't like me in there. And really, there was a lot of people that really didn't like me being part of the mm. JCCP. Um, raising things, saying, I disagree with that, being outvoted, 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 which is, you know, such a sad mm. thing. But we've got we've got beauty industry groups, so all the industry organisations still go uh, that meet together. When we had COVID, we were on the uh, um, panel, so I was on the panels making sure the government knew all the right information. As soon as Boris did an announcement on Friday night, did we get that email come through? Meeting in an hour's time to you know do that, uh, uh, write the sort of the standards and the working practices in the sector and stuff like that just to make sure that we could get people back out into work and, and do all sorts of things. So we've been a room across the board on all the various different things, championing the way, we've worked with the board and organisations, we've worked across the board. Now I've got to say the barriers, my goodness, no, you pretty can't do that. No, you can't I do think that. this is the problem, I think it's always like it's a toy that nobody feels that they want to play with. But actually, this toy has been around for a long time. Mm. It's like Lego. It's brilliant. It's used. It's a great brand. But I think it's diversified so much that it's kind of almost separated. But actually, it's got stronger. And I think what's been shown is more and more people are having all of these services. More and more people are having these things. And actually, we're providing a great service. Yes, there does need to be changes, which we all agree upon. But I think what you've done really well is you've gathered all of these experts, you've gathered all these people together, and you've managed to keep the door open for us. And I kind of just want to ring that bell for you one last time here is people need to know that Caroline Laracy has 100% for the last 15 years kept this lane open for none medics your name if you look across all stakeholders if you look across all the groups is there and you 100 percent have kept this going for us so i thank you personally on behalf of all the non-medics from the aesthetic side and i think now drawing a line in the sand learning from the past and what you've achieved and what you've done and all the things and really it's a new chapter but I think as a new chapter, it's just the beginning. Yeah. 
And I do think now moving forward into this next phase, people need to stop infighting. Yeah. Having this conversation that really people want us to have because it kind of is a smoke screen and they want us to argue, they want us to in have these insights when actually the core part of it for me is good training, good education, good standards. And really, we all want to be part of the industry and give the client a choice and that client to know exactly what choice they have and to go to an establishment where they understand they're safe, they're insured, they're educated, trained correctly, and they're licensed in an environment. So I think... Where do you see all of this coming together? Where do you see this middle lane for everybody? I think uh, I think we've still got a battle on our hands. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a battle yesterday. I had I was speaking to an environmental health officer that was wanting to close a salon down because he didn't believe that uh, non-medics should be doing some of the treatments. Mm. And it was like, well, I'm sorry, but you know, right into doing that. Well, I can get her on the Health and Safety at Work Act. I said, well, you need to give her notice mm-hmm. on what she's doing wrong with the Health and Safety Work Act. He says, and then I said, she's one of our members. So I have got a health and safety toolkit that is prime authority approved, mm-hmm. which means that every, if they follow everything in that toolkit, then I've got Surrey and Woking Council that will fight on that sound's behalf because they remember. And, and it's it's that sort of little bits of things. And this is where I want to bring in the NHBF because really you've got the codes, you've got the tools, you've got the business in a box kind of model, really. And that's what we know at A Training and my business here have embraced. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. All of your years of experience, everything that you've brought together, the trust for the sector, you've now created this pack. We've taken on board this pack. And this is what I want everybody out there that's listening to this, watching this, needs to understand. The NHBF have already got this available. We need to all come together now and really kind of ring the bell, all join all become part of this and then we can have an identity and I believe you are the right person to champion this moving forward Caroline you've already done this you've already got it in place and what you've been shown yesterday by fighting on behalf of this member there are still dark forces there are still people out there that are trying to close the doors people are kind of saying oh we want to wait for the government to make this recommendation that's wrong. It's like saying, well, let's wait for the weather to change before we go outside. So talk to me and tell me what the NHBF have got available for people out there that want to join. So if you were looking at where we are with our campaigning, we've got a massive campaign. Um, You'll have to go onto our website, go onto campaigning, and you'll see where we've done on aesthetics. We were very much fundamental in the APPG, the All Parliamentary Group, um, and that report is part of that. So we've always been doing that side of, of the campaigning for the sector because we truly believe, you know, that in a hair and beauty businesses, you know, aesthetics is already in there. Do you know what I mean? And that's part of our membership package. So we've been doing that for quite a number of um, years as part of that. We've got a manifesto. We speak to each of the ministers. Yes, we've got this big announcement from government, you know, regarding the consultation and outside of consultation. I've already been in touch with the Department of Health and and Social Care. We know it's coming out. We we know there's some recommendations. We know it's actually been pulled back a little bit as well uh, because the government has now got 100 days because it's a new government to come in place. So there's all various different things. And so we are on the pulse. I've got a dedicated director who is our policy and public affairs who's in there with each of the government departments making sure we know exactly what's happening so we can let our members know exactly what they need to do. Don't need to look at the scaremongering. Don't need to look at all the sites to say, what if, you know, everybody loves a sensational headline. And I think a lot of this is blown up because of the sensational headlines. And I know I suppose I spoke to somebody the other day and they said, I've got more chance of getting run over by a bus than having, you know, a, a treatment go wrong. And it's like, yeah, but we need to get this message out because people believe what they hear in the newspapers. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what we've been trying to do with, with our members. 
we give our members the facts of what happened, not any subjective information or stuff like that. And they can rely on us as a reliable source. So, for example, for the, uh, you know, the legislation that's coming in, we've been looking at Wales. We've been working with Wales. Wales is far ahead than what England is on this. They've already got their legislation in place. They're already doing it for electrolysis and, you know, a couple of other procedures. That's already in place. So if you want to look at what the legislation is going to look like, look to Wales. We've got all that information as part of our, you know, membership stuff as part of that. We've got all the health and safety information, business support, all that type of thing. Legal advice, helpline, 24-7 legal advice, contracts, HR, all the various different things to, you know, to help a, a business grow. Because that's what we're there for. We are there for practitioners to go and do and work on the shop floor because that's what we want to do. And then we support all the business side of things. So it makes sure that they are safe, they are legal and they are profitable. And that's our mantra. So I think three things for me key to why I've brought your attention, you know, brought you here for this chat today with our kind of group. We've got 21,000 people that we've trained and, and, and really I want to champion, you know, NHBF and you personally, Caroline, as part of NHBF because I know that you as the lead on this are always championing for us and you're not just really going to be butterflying through this you have a real pull to get this where it needs to be and I think you are the person that can do it so we're going to put links towards the membership for NHBF we're going to kind of put out there we'll do a, a, an email out to our database as well and where people can share this podcast and get the name because for me this really needs to snowball and people need to become part of an HBF we need to really have a strong foothold and then a voice as one that we can push forward so we're championing the NHBF the membership and you personally to push forward to this for the last 15 years this is not kind of you've just woken up and you're going to kind of push forward and it's trendy to kind of be part of this because it's not easy but you've got the experience you've got 15 years you've got the trust and most importantly you've got our well-being at the forefront of each and every single member from their business to put forward so as part of that membership, are you going to grow the aesthetics part? Are you seeing that there's a footprint for to move forward with taking on board what the government recommend? Absolutely. So I see uh, um, aesthetic is just an integral part of hair and beauty. You know, we're all under one roof mm-hmm. uh, uh, and that's the business uh, side of it. And, you know, we're doing, as I said, we've done a lot of stuff on aesthetics and we've done a lot of, you know, campaigning and, and lots of things moving forward. We have state of the industry surveys that we've done. Um, these are snapshot surveys. Um, we send them out to the industry, but, uh, have, get all the feedback. That goes directly to the Department of Business and Trade. And the Department of Business and Trade use our statistics to look at the direction the government's going. So we have a real opportunity to really do affect what the government direction is going to be. We directly speak to ministers. Um, we speak to ministers on a number of issues. It's not just aesthetics, it's on the business side of things. It might be on minimum wage, it might be on all various different things. Because the business isn't just about you know the treatments in there, it's about the whole thing um, as well. And that's why we've got so many tools and resources. And the NHBF, I mean, I've only been chief exec now for six months. And we've but had- I know you have got lots of new and exciting and oh great things in store. Yeah. And I think anyone listening to this, watching this, being sat aside with the passion and, and having known you for the time that I've known you, I know you're going to take it on. I know you're going to move forward with it. And I think that's why we all need to get behind you. We all need to join you as one. We all need to become part of the NHBF. And this needs to become our legs. This needs to be where we know we can go for advice. Factual, actual, and information that's been tried and tested and it's going to be strong and it's going to protect you, protect your business, 
And most importantly, know that you have someone who's got your back that you can trust. So um, you do a business membership and you do a... Yeah. So what so type of so membership we, uh, do you do? Um, so we're actually going to be developing our membership even more than what we've got now. So we've got what we call our traditional NHBF membership, which is a business membership. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a salon, a barbershop or a clinic, you can join as a, an NH business member as part of that. We also have what we call trade members, but it's actually we're going to change this and that's going to become a short trade mm -hmm. member um, because we want the quality assurance checks. And that's for anybody that's aligned to the sector. So that could be manufacturers, distributors, product, you know, colleges, training providers, all across the board. Because what we see at the moment is that there is a lot of people that are working in the sector, a lot of businesses. But when your salon, clinic or barbershop looks, they don't know who to trust. No. So when they look at the training providers, there's a proliferation of training providers. Yeah. And you think, hmm, that one looks quite good. It's local, do you know, I might mm -hmm. do that one. But actually, do you know that they're actually having de delivering regulated qualifications? Do you know they're up to standard? Do you know they've been also inspected? All that sort of needs thing. Needs a kite mark. And the needs a kite mark. And so that's where we're going to be pulling in the energy of So we're yeah. going to have an insured certificate. But also as part of the uh, traditional membership, what we're also going to do is we're going to do assured stamps for businesses as well. Mm -hmm. So it's about if you go through the health and safety, embed the health and safety, you get a digital credential that says your health and safety assured. Mm -hmm. And that's some kind of mark that you can put and you can put that in a little window. Mm -hmm. So when that you know little environmental health officer comes on, because it's got that assured sticker mm -hmm. and it's got the primary authority, they'll know from just seeing that mm -hmm. little sticker that your business is assured when it comes to health and safety mm. by a prime authority, which is absolutely great, which will just, to me, I think what we need to do is raise the standards in the sector. And we do that quite a lot. I mean, we have our professional code of conduct. So if you become a member of ours, you have to adhere to the code of conduct. And there's, you know, various different things with there that, you know, that's very detailed. This is what you have to do as part of that. And it's just standard things. Just like you said, being insured, making sure you've got the right qualifications, making sure that if you've got the apprenticeships, apprentices in there, they're supervised, all the very distant fundamentals. It's not war and peace. It's a two little page document. Mm -hmm. But all that's there is to make sure that your business is safe and legal mm -hmm. because that's what we want to do. But I think people listening, watching this to kind of come to a summary is... I'm not sure people know that that's available. Yeah. I think they're all waiting for this announcement. They're all waiting for, um, you know, things like JCCP or other people to make decisions when actually, really, there has been. So, um, NHBF, how long have you been around? 82 years. 82, 82 years. years. So, yeah. as a kind of membership for our sector, you've been around 82 years. You've got a direct voice to government. Yes. Yeah, you've got links, you've got codes, you've got all of this. So you, to me, already have everything in place. You're already a champion and you're the right person to lead. You're the right voice. You definitely won't let us down. So you have got definitely the stamp from me and from A Training, all of our team here. And we're going to be doing everything we can moving forward to get this out there to all of the people that are part of our tribe so that they know where to go and we can signpost them to you. Um, and I feel that this is a shift and a change that needs to happen. You know, there is this available. It's already here. We all just need to join. We all need to become part of it and then really watch it grow and link in with it for the advice so that rather than x y z the amount of times that comes to my inbox oh have you seen this have you heard this and i'm like it's not factual it's not actual you know don't listen to it don't be part of the forum i think once and for all people need to know this is the place to go yeah my mantra has always been raising the quality and standard and letting our sector shine yeah absolutely so I feel that we're going to bring some links back. We've also got a magazine as well that we can kind of link out things for the future. So just to kind of bring it back a little bit fun, I think because anybody listening to this might think, 
gosh, where does this woman <laughs> actually, you know, the woman of this power, <laughs> yeah, this woman of power, this woman who has got so much going on that's achieved so much, how do you chill, what switches you off, what's your downtime, how do you get some you time? So, I'm a Reiki master. Wow. Uh, um, I did my Reiki two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that came from COVID. So what's Reiki? Tell me what Reiki uh, re- is. So it's all about energies. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, during COVID, as I said, I was on the government panels. And it was intense, as you can imagine, every Friday night when something changes. And particularly when, you know, the sector is at risk mm. on some of the decisions that you do. It was, um, there was me, there was only a couple of the other organisations in the sector around the table, and we were desperate to get the community sector open. Mm-hmm. But the thing was, we are England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and we weren't talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And so when we had meetings in England, we then had to have a separate meeting in Scotland, separate, and then the advice was different, mm-hmm. and they changed everything. And so it was a very, very stressful time Mm -hmm. um and i started doing meditation Mm -hmm. um because i I just couldn't switch myself up because everything was like i mean my goodness i don't know how my husband didn't divorce Mm -hmm. me at the time (laughs) it was like a bit of a whirlwind yeah but i just felt like i just needed to do it for the sector and so i found that meditation was a way of being able to focus myself and really zone myself out and that sort of thing and then I used to do a lot of bike riding, mm-hmm. and then I had an accident off my bike. Wow. Um, I, a pothole literally uh-huh. off the bike, and I dislocated my shoulder, so this shoulder was like down there. Right. Raced to, you know, I used to do emergency, blah, blah, blah. I ended up having to have two pins in my shoulder. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of pain with it. And a friend of mine came and said, Let me do some Reiki. Uh, and she did me some Reiki, and I was just like, oh, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I was laid there and I could feel this heat and I could feel this pulling in my in my shoulder mm-hmm. and I got my eyes closed sure. so I had no idea what she was doing and I thought she got her hands there uh-huh. she was doing and raking you do pull all sure. the you know, negative energies out of your shoulder and I just after that and I was just like this is just absolutely fantastic so then I started you know learning about you know um, energies I'm quite lucky, my, my uh, um, grandma was a medium, so I'm very mm-hmm. onto the spiritual mm-hmm. side mm-hmm. of things and very embracing. So I started doing Reiki, Reiki Level 1, mm-hmm. and my first client had got in front of me, and I started doing this sort of, you know, this sort of Reiki movements and stuff like that, and I got this lady here, and I got this flood of emotion, and I burst out into tears, sobbing my heart out, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, and blah, blah, blah. And the lady who was doing the training went, you're right. I said, yes, not me, it's this lady. I've never met this lady mm-hmm, before. Mm-hmm. She lost her husband. Oh. And she hemmed up all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And I just felt mm-hmm. all her mm-hmm. energies and stuff like that. And I thought, gosh, this is so powerful. Yeah. You know, to balance yourself mm-hmm. and do that. And, uh, and yeah, that's what made me go into Reiki sure. and, and understand all that. And I think as things. an individual, when we're working with clients, you know, as much as as a professional, you know, we have got our own personal boundaries. You know, we are listening, we are feeling, we are sensing, mind, body, spirit. And again, very much like you, my mantra has always been, you know, the universal energy yeah. I was working on that level. So it's very interesting, great to hear that you've got a balance. You do your meditation, you've got your time out, you're doing your spiritual side, you're raking, you're raking masters, which is kind of nice that... You know, you're doing your forefront of being heading up the NHBF and kind of moving forward with that, but you've got your time out, which is really good. Um, and I'm kind of thinking how this 24 hours works in a day, but I'm sure you kind of got... Um, I've got a little dog as well, which is also a therapy. And you do Anybody who's got a pet will tell you they are the biggest therapy in the world. Yeah. And they make you go out. So when I have a busy day, and sometimes, you know, people are the same, you get onto your computer, and you just get yourself. Mum, I need to go out for a walk. And that going out for a walk and taking yourself out of that yeah. situation is the absolute best therapy yes, yes. because, it's, again, it's about, you know, it's about the world, isn't it? And it's it about is. the energies in the world bringing it back to you. And, uh, um, yeah, and I'm a great believer in other principles. Um, you reap what you sow. You put out positive energy, you get positive energy back. You put out negative energy, you're going to, going to get negative energy. For me, it's all about the positive. Uh, um, and that's why I love the sector. 
I mean, exactly. That's why I do what and I do. And I think there's so much good within the sector, and I feel you are a powerhouse and a woman that has kind of taken this sector and really championed it. And I'm really excited for the future. As I said, we'll put lots of links. We'll kind of link with our team, our members, our tribe, get the emails out and cross-reference, cross-pollinate. To me, there's enough out there for everybody. This is about us coming together as one. I would like to be part of bringing that everybody together, being a voice that kind of puts that voice in the right direction, signposting it to the right people. And for a long time, people have asked me to kind of like, you know, where do we go? What do we do? And for a long time, I've kind of sat on the fence because not being ready to sort of signpost people. But now I feel 100%. Now is the time to become a member of the NHBF and as part of you, Caroline. And I'm trusting that everyone listens and hears how much you've done for us as a sector and I can't thank you enough uh, and I feel very excited for the consultation, I feel very excited for what comes out of it and I know that we'll all be able to embrace it, shift, change adapt, all come together all improve the standards and really anyone who's got their self worth and knows that they're doing it correct has nothing to worry about, the only people who are out there that need to worry are the ones that are not doing it correctly and that's what this is all about. So thank you for your time. I know you're very busy. You've got a very busy day today. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your time here today. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you.